Sooner or later, every man meets his Waterloo, even in Montana Territory. At the time Colonel Custer was meeting his, I very nearly met mine. Frontier Gentlemen. with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. I had received permission to accompany a troop of soldiers and packers up the Yellowstone to the mouth of Rosebud Creek and through the kindness of a Lieutenant Snow in charge of the supply depot, I'd found quarters aboard the river steamer far west. There was an air of expectancy about. A scout had brought news that the main concentration of the Sioux Army had been sighted somewhere between the Rosebud and the Bighorn. It was Lieutenant Snow who informed me. Well, they've sent Custer in the 7th, Mr. Kendall. We'll see an end to it now. He'll finish the Sioux. I wish I had known. I'd like to have gone with him. Well, maybe Custer will bring back Sitting Bull or a Crazy Horse. You'll be able to have your interviews. <laughs> I've about given up hope. Oh, don't worry. If they're still alive when the colonel's through with them, you'll get your chance. Glad to hear it. Oh, they should have let Custer attack the Sioux a long time ago. Well, now you'll see. He'll massacre them. Lieutenant... Oh, how are you, Mr. Kendall? Well, thank you, Captain. Lieutenant, just got word there are civilians up at Castle Butte. I haven't got anybody else for the job, so you'll have to do it. Bring them in, Captain? Yes. We haven't had any reports of enemy movement in that area, but watch yourself. I can't spare you more than four men and a crow scout. Now, if you do run into hostiles, turn back. Don't engage them. That's an order, Snow. Yes, sir. And the civilians? Well, that's their lookout. They were ordered in a month ago. If you can get them out safely, good. If not, don't risk the lives of your men. There's been enough heroics around here. I won't risk the lives of the men, sir. Very sensible. See that you don't. Now, you'll leave immediately, and the location is here. You better cross west to Porcupine Creek and then head north. Uh, Captain Thomas, I, I wonder, if Lieutenant Snow has no objection, may I go with him? Well, I don't suppose there's any reason why you shouldn't. No? Fine with me, sir. I thought you'd want to be here, Mr. Kendall, when the conquering hero returns. Make an interesting story for your London Times. I beg your pardon? Oh, we'll be back in time, Mr. Kendall. Captain Thomas is referring to Colonel Custer. Oh. Uh, <laughs> the young lieutenant and I don't see eye to eye about the colonel. No, we don't, sir. Well, it's a matter of opinion. I won't bore you with mine, Mr. Kendall. Uh... Snow, he'll issue a horse and a rifle to Mr. Kendall and see that he signs for them. Yes, sir. Good luck. There are times when it's hard to remember rank. The trouble with him is he's not West Point. He resents anybody else who is. Well, you've just had a good look at professional jealousy, Kendall. Odd. I wouldn't have thought that of the captain. No. Pretty obvious, isn't it? Come along. We'd better get going. You see, the captain thinks it was a mistake to send Custer after the Sioux. Oh, uh, why? Well, our military genius is of the opinion that Custer's a bad soldier. Out for personal gain, that he's too impetuous, that it'll make a mess of things. Uh, of course, there's also the incidental point that Thomas is a captain. Two years older than Custer, who's a colonel. And uh, that's where I say the trouble <laughs> is. When I was in the army in India... I had an officer who affected me that way. He was a colonel, too. Dreadful old blunderbuss. <laughs> I was positive I knew more than he did. Well, did you? Well, as a matter of fact, I did. He ordered us to attack a Sikh stronghold. There must have been 2,000 tribesmen, and we had about 400 lancers. 
I suggested it might be a mistake, and he nearly died of apoplexy. Oh. I somehow wish he had. Only 30 of us got out of that mess alive. <laughs> Our destination was some 15 miles north and west of the mouth of Rosebud Creek. There were seven of us. Lieutenant Snow, Sergeant Wilson, three troopers, and a Crow Indian scout with the intriguing name of Six Toes. Intriguing because, as far as I could determine, he had only five on each foot. We had traveled fast without incident when the scout brought us to a halt. Smoke over hill near Castle Butte. Any sign of Sue or Sam? Have been passing this way. Maybe small party, seven, eight. Sergeant? How long ago, Six Toes? Walk a mile, maybe less. He means 20 minutes or less. Ah. Sir? Six Toes says there's a sign of the enemy, Wilson. Smoke just over the hill. Now, they may have attacked the party we're looking for. Stay here and keep your eyes open. I'm going to ride up the hill and take a look. Yes, sir. Now, I'd, I'd like to come along. All right, Kendall. Six Toes, you too. Here. Oh. Can't see what it's coming from. Trees are in the way. Well, if it's a raiding party, we might still get them. See that canyon to the left? We could ride through there. Well, nasty place for an ambush, though. Well, worth the chance. We'd come up under cover of the trees. Not good place if Sue got big party waiting. No reason why they should. There haven't been any reports of any big war parties up here. Probably a few renegades. Sergeant Wilson? Uh, look here, old boy. <laughs> It's none of my business, but four men in those rocks could hold off a small army. Wouldn't it be safer to take the direct approach? Open country? You'd stand a better chance. Mr. Kendall, I don't know how you fought in India, but over here, surprise tactics are the only way. Beat the Indian at his own game. Out guess him. Yes, very sound. When you can do it. What is it, Lieutenant? You see that canyon, Sergeant? We're going through. If the Sioux are where the smoke is, we'll take them by surprise. Wipe them out. Oh, you hear that? Settlers are holding them off. Kendall, you want to stay here? We'll pick you up on our way back. I think I'd rather come along. Don't want to miss the fun. We rode down the hill toward the narrow canyon. Lieutenant Snow is sitting erect in his saddle, eyes sparkling with excitement, a smile on his lips. I had seen such a look before in young subalterns going into their first battle, unafraid, not knowing. Up the gallop! The mouth of the canyon drew closer. The shadows reached out to us. Then we were in it, the walls looming on either side. I didn't look back. I knew from the sound of that first volley what had happened. And when I emerged from the canyon, there was only one other man a short distance behind me. It was the Crow Indian scout. Go around the trees! Don't go through! Yeah. Now take a look. See if anyone's alive in there. I'll try the smaller cabin. Where are the others? I... We didn't expect to find anyone alive. I saw you on the hill. Fired the shots. I was afraid you'd go away. We'd better go inside. All burned in other cabin. He's Dead. an Indian. He's not coming in. Six Toes is a crow scout for the army. A friend. I heard shooting in the canyon. Did the soldiers kill them? 
I'm afraid not. We were the only ones to escape. They saw you. That's why they left. Now they'll come back. How many were there? Seven. To begin with. We killed two. Well, not so bad. You should be able to defend this quite nicely, I think. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. Sixto's. I'm going out to the horses to get the rest of the ammunition in our canteens. Cover me from the window. Hello there, ho. Ho, boy. Quiet. Quiet, boy. There. I'm sorry. That was a very foolish thing to do. I'm all right now. Good. I've got a gun and ammunition. I know how to shoot. Couldn't be better. Six toes, keep watch where you are. The lady and I will take this side. My name is Amelia Mitchell. How do you do? I'm J.B. Kendall. Did... Did you see a little boy out there? In the other cabin? No, but perhaps he... He was in there. With my brother and the other men. They were putting up a stockade when the Indians started to shoot. I was in here getting some nails. I saw what happened through the window. It was so quick. Then there was the fire. And the cries. I hope he died before the fire. Your boy? My son. Ten years old. It's not right, is it? No. It's not right. You, tall man. Yes. Indians coming. Cheyenne. See them through trees. Where? Wait. You see. There. All right. Now don't waste shots. We'll wait for them to come out into the open. In a moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. Do you have questions on satellites, Davis Cup teams, a new medical technique? Answer, please, with Walter Cronkite as your answer. Hear him every weekday evening on most of these stations. And send your questions to Answer, Please, CBS Radio, New York 22, New York. That's Answer, Please, CBS Radio, New York 22, New York. And now we return you to Anthony Ellis' production of Frontier Gentlemen. for the Cheyenne to come out into the clearing, away from the cover of the trees, but they didn't. Neither did we get a chance for a decent shot at them. The sun began to go down. Shadows lengthened. In the little cabin, a shaft of pale sunlight poured through a crack in the heavy shutters. It was very warm. Amelia Mitchell, possibly 35, rather tall, her face glistening in the heat, the Winchester rifle held firm in her broad hands. I was suddenly and unaccountably very conscious of her. They must be waiting for nightfall. Possibly. Anything on your side, Six Toes? Nothing moves. You're English, aren't you? Hmm? Uh, yes. Where did you go to school, Oxford? <laughs> As a matter of fact, it was Cambridge. Oh. You disappointed? No. I thought it would be Oxford. If my boy had lived, I would have liked him to go to Oxford or Harvard. One of those fine colleges. Strange talking about him now. As though he'd been gone a long time. 
I suppose I never did have him, really. Not really. Was your husband in the other cabin? No. I've never been married. I came out here with my brother. He thought it would be best for for us, my boy and me. Best to make a new life. Oh, well, I... You don't have to be embarrassed now that the boy is gone. I'm glad to talk about it. I was a school teacher. After the war, I met a man. He was a returning hero. It was lonely. I never saw him again after that one time. You could have married. No. A decent man wouldn't have wanted that. Well, for me, there was somebody in England. I suppose not quite the same thing, but... Now she married somebody else. I think I felt very much the same way as you did. It was a mistake. It's funny, you and me, you and I, talking like this. What were you doing here? My brother and the others were in partnership, mining. We thought we might have found a rich vein. Well, when this is over, you'll be very rich. Do the things, see what you've always wanted to, go to Europe, England... (gasps) Lieutenant Snow, they are... I know. There's nothing we can do. Better go back to your post. Soon dark comes, tall men. Maybe then they attack. (laughs) It's not a good thing to hear. That's a pretty good reason why they're doing it. You afraid? I am a crow. I'm not afraid of noise. I know what Cheyennes do. Of this I am afraid. We'll try a diversion. Might bring them out. And no more than three rounds each. Fire between the trees. Perhaps one of us will be lucky enough to hit poor old Snow. It was no good. I knew that with darkness they would come. There would be no moon. They would wait and then set fire to the cabin. If we tried to run out, it would be mercifully quick. A bullet. Nothing more. I'm not sure what it was that made me decide. The sight of the woman standing next to me or the sound of Lieutenant Snow's agony. But suddenly I knew what had to be done. Look here. We can wait until they burn us out, or we can do something. Six toes, will you go out there with me? We are two against them. Woman, no good. She will stay here. I'm not afraid to die, as my father has done fighting Cheyenne, but would like to take one scalp with me, tall man. In a few... In a few minutes, it should be dark enough. If we can get out of here without them seeing us. And no rifles. We'll take our pistols... But I don't want to use them unless we absolutely have to. Hatchet. And knife, quietly. Is good. Now the back window. Then cut around behind them in the trees. They not think white man will do this. I hope not. Woman fires into trees many times while we go. Yes, and uh, keep it up for a minute or two. Give us a chance to get out there. Out there. All right. I think you know what to do if we don't come back, Miss Mitchell. I know. Goodbye, Mr. Kendall. Start firing. Wait. Oh, the poor Walla. Quietly now, six times. Mm, you make good Indian. Won't be long now, Snow. Won't be long. I can see two of them. Standing over the lieutenant. Another over there, behind high bush. Yes, that's three. Where's the other two? All right, stay here. I'll get the chappie at the bush. You bring back scalp. And the civilized devil, of course not. (laughs) 
you get him? I get him. Your turn, dear fellow. Two more and we can use our guns. There? Huh? Where? Two near trees, looking out to cabin. Ah. Uh-huh. Come on. We'll never get across the clearing without them seeing us. Can you throw the hatchet? Very good at throwing. You watch. Together. One. Two. Three. Oh, blast. Fine bloody aim you've got. Quick. Can barely see them now. Shoot, and for Lord's sake, don't miss. Shoot. Six toes got three scalps that night. We carried Lieutenant Snow back to the cabin. That he was still alive was a miracle. It would have perhaps been better had he been dead. Amelia Mitchell did what she could for him, but he died in the early morning. When we returned to the Rosebud the next day, the Battle of Little Bighorn was over. As Lieutenant Snow had predicted, it had been a massacre. Custer's troops had been wiped out. Those other wounded under Major Reno's command were being carried aboard the riverboat, the far west. I stood with Miss Mitchell and Captain Thomas, watching the wounded being carried aboard. Where would they take them, Captain Thomas? Down river to the hospital. Doesn't seem possible. Two of my best friends were with Custer. Porter, Sturgis. Both gone. I'm sorry. It was a mistake. A terrible mistake. Yes. I imagine it was. Uh, you and Miss Mitchell will go with the wounded? Uh, Miss Mitchell will. I'll see you on board. You're not going. No. I don't think so. I see. And, uh, and you? I'll be able to help at the hospital. Then sooner or later there'll be a school out here. I'll teach again. Oh, you'll get married. There'll be other children besides those in your school. I don't know. What about you? I'll be sending my story to the London Times, then I'll go north. There's a town called Fort Benton. I hope we shall meet again, Mr. Kendall. I hope so, Miss Mitchell. Well, you'd better go aboard now. Good luck. Goodbye. Frontier Gentleman was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Jeanette Nolan, Clark Gordon, Lawrence Dobkin, and Jack Moyles. Music was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The success of the fight for freedom depends upon our getting the truth to people behind the Iron Curtain. If the spark to freedom is to stay alive, Radio Free Europe must remain on the air. You can help keep it there by contributing your truth dollars now to Crusade for Freedom. Just send your contribution to Crusade for Freedom in care of your local postmaster. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentlemen. Dan Coverley speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network.